Hi everybody, welcome to chapter 12 in Owens and Valesky, which is our school reform chapter. I want to stress a few things if you're watching this video. Um, this program that you're currently in does a lot with school reform. It's been covered a number of times in other classes. I can think of five classes on the top of my head that all of you have to take that are school reform specific classes. So really, I just want to do a couple of things here. I want to give you a review of some of the things you learned about in other courses. And I also want to give you some specifics about some things that might help you for your dissertation topics and for your research. Um, I'm thinking of this more organizationally linked than to school reform. Um, so I'm going to do this in quick snapshot form and focus more on that. So one of the things that you have to keep in mind right now is that, you know, we're interested in this market system of education, and it's huge. It's the biggest organizational reform that all of you are seeing in your school systems, but I would argue this region, it's not hitting as hard as it is in the Northeast, specifically around New York, Washington, D.C., um, the New England states, or all of California and Oregon. So the charter school movement, the voucher movement, and the tax credits and the tax deduction stuff is an important, yeah, but it's not really made its way down our path as it has in a lot of the other states. <clears throat> so, you know, that's exactly what I just said. It's location specific. Um, we had, you know, my home state is huge in charters and vouchers, but in western Pennsylvania, we've only had two charter schools. Most of them are in Philadelphia. So, yes, when you say Pennsylvania is a big charter school state, I was from western Pennsylvania. I worked, you know, essentially within, within a two-hour radius of, of a lot of major cities, and we only had two charter schools. If you would have pushed out more west and got to Ohio, there was more there. If you would have pushed out more east and got to Philadelphia, there were more there. So I argue that if you're managing a large urban district or affiliated with an urban area, then you need to know charter schools and vouchers. And that's something that hopefully you, know, you can look at and see if that fits your interests and your areas of needs on your own. <clears throat> so at the publication of the textbook, only 13 states do tax credits and tax deductions. Oklahoma is one of them. Um, it gives individuals and corporations money to scholarship organizations. Um, it lets them fund so that they can choose schools, whether they're public schools or private schools, um, but the money is individual or corporate and not public funding. I don't see anything wrong with this. I think this is a good model. I think it's effective. I, I actually am completely 100% in support of this. If you can do tax credits or tax deductions, that's wonderful. So. Um, Market-based school reforms is really uh, Chubb and Mo school economics, which you probably learned about in your school reform class, um, really talking about the politics markets of schools, showing that if we had market-based schools, it would give autonomy to schools and would it also, more importantly, put pressure on public schools. So this has kind of happened, but it was really pulling for you know, market-based schools and school choice, you have to realize though the unintended consequences that happen with that. How many people would switch districts if that meant they were going to get a better education? I'm sure a lot would. So Milton Friedman is the one that did a lot of work on um, economic theory and school reform. His belief was that schools should operate like business, open markets, parents select to send their children. The advantage to this is obviously this would give school choice to parents. That's great. If your child can receive a better education or more individualized education in another district, that's perfect. The disadvantage to the system is the bad districts would lose almost all of their kids, and it would be stuck with the districts, it would be stuck with the students in the district that were your low performers anyway, or the ones that just didn't have the financial support in order to be successful. So the concept of this is great, and I don't want anybody to tell me the concept isn't a good idea. The execution is nearly impossible and the after effects are horrible, but the concept is a good idea because you should be free to buy from whatever you want and do whatever you want more Americans. But you know what that looks like, that's the question. So you know this basically says people would make rational choices based on their own interests for their children. That's why we're in education, we're supposed to be here to do what's best for kids. But the other thing that I want to note is human issues in the workplace. If 
30% of the student population left a particular district, that would be 30% of employees that would have to be let go or fired. That would not be positive at all, and we couldn't have that. So that would cause issues and problems in itself. It would be an unintended consequence of something, um, of, of something that could be good for schools. So, you know, if you lived on the border between Oklahoma and Arkansas, which some of you do, um, if you choose to send your child to Arkansas, you know, to Arkansas while living in Oklahoma, Oklahoma, we moved past the state system. Now there is federal control and federal, if, if federal, just federal discretion because your child is going across state lines. This would screw taxes royally because that money would have to be distributed between one source or another, and there isn't a right or wrong answer for what you're supposed to do. For transportation issues, um, that would even be worse for busing. Because as you know, busing in the state of Oklahoma is controlled at the state level. Sure, most districts own their own buses, but the whole function of busing is a state function. It is not a local function. Um, I, would say, I would argue there would be segregation. It would be, it would be unintended segregation. So that would be a challenge with that as well. So Channel One, um, I love our textbook talking about Channel One because this was uh, Channel One was my arch enemy and nemesis when I was in public schools. So um, Channel One um, was something that was a great idea back in the 90s. And if you don't remember Channel One, um, I want you to tr try to just listen to me and, and hear what this concept is. So we had this system basically that promised that we would give a free television, free cable um, in every single classroom in the state of Pennsylvania. The change that you had to do in the system you had agreed to was something called Channel One. Channel One was basically a kids news program that was broadcast in schools. Um, it was broadcast just to give them, you know, an understanding and an overview of, you know, what watching the news looks like, that sort of thing. The problem was, this was the most liberal television that I have ever seen in my life. Like, liberal to the point where I, I, would, just, I would just shake my head at how, at how one-sided it was. If you're going to do something like this, and the government's going to be involved, it's important that they present a non-biased perspective. So we had to mandate that our children watch this in home rooms. Because if anybody came in to assess what Channel 1 looked like, we could get into a lot of trouble. So instead of just leaving it on and having people talk, we told the kids you had to put everything away and you had to actually watch what the television was telling you. Um, the three districts I worked in, only one, one of the poor districts, was the one that did this. I found this to be a reform issue. Yeah, sure, it was great that they all had free televisions and free cable, but um, it disturbed me more than anything that um, it was basically done with this, you know, government, you know, government controlled ideas to kids, and I did not like that. So, the state takeover in Philadelphia, the book talked about this. Um, I thought this was fascinating because I lived this. Um, the charter school company took over. Um, they had control of 20 different schools. Other universities and community agencies actually, you know, restructured and redesigned the schools. The district took it on. Um, they were more managers now than people that were in charge. And the big findings were there were no differences in school achievement gains among for-profits, non-profits, and universities. Um, the restructured districts had higher math scores, but there weren't low, there weren't, there weren't, not, and there, there weren't any differences in the reading schools, there weren't competitive, competitive advantages over local public schools, and there were not longitudinal differences um, over the charters. So the math did have a reform and a restructure, which once again, maybe I'm relating that to BRIC. Maybe if we did more interactions and more interventions with different parents on math, it might have a long-term effect. So our next thing that we're going to look at is um, online education. This is wonderful. Um, it's funny how online education has been sold. Um, if you ask me how online education was sold in 2005, I would tell you it was for convenience, for religious purposes, um, you know, to, give, to prepare children for the next steps in the next century. The marketing strategy in online education has changed completely. It's now linked to bullying more than anything else. Um, most states will offer it. Most private companies will offer it. Um, you know, maybe partnering with the school district, but you know, they'll develop the curriculum, they'll sell it to you, 
um, that we can't exactly do much work on comparing these or, conform or, or conforming them to one sort of uh, one sort of perspective. I will say this, you have a discussion board that is really going to look at online education and I want you to take that seriously because this gives you the opportunity to really compare online education as a potential catalyst for school reform. And it's up to you to determine whether or not it's effective or not. So um, what has research shown us about charter schools? Um, public schools perform as well or better than charter and private schools. Um, it's so inconclusive on the effects of the results, and charter schools are more segregated by race and will overall attract more white students. Um, I look at charter schools sometimes as, a, as an unintended consequence of white flight, um, but I also look at it as an ELL thing as well, because if you can have a charter that's more geared towards um, ELL usage, that's also, that's also beneficial as well. So, vouchers. Um, no improvement on vouchers, they're not more effective than public schools, and they had no impact on college enrollment. Um, so the, this is current research from Owens and Valesky. It's up to you to determine the validity of it. If you think it's great, great. If you don't, I understand. But I at least wanted to share it with you so you had it in front of you and you could make your own decisions. So privatization in virtual education and higher education. So this, I would argue, is more, um, it's, it's becoming more of a reality. The cost of education has grown exponentially. It is more expensive, not only is it more expensive, there are more problems um, with people getting loans and tuition money versus federal grants, even state grants or private grants. So online education has stepped in and has tried to reduce the cost. Um, University of Phoenix, when you say online education, that's who you think about because that's the name that you think about. But as a response, many public universities have been, dis have been dis developing distance learning programs, which can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. Um, I lay that in your hands to make those decisions. Um, we have lots of people that are taking at least one online class. Um, we have one-third of the population takes at least one online course as a learning mechanism. So is there more efficiency um, you know, in online classes? 56% of faculty respondents say the effort is greater for online classes. Um, I'm going to make a comment on this. This is my opinion on it. If you take the time to design and develop an online class well, you're spending about two to three hundred hours doing it. But once it's there, it's there. It, it, it can self-sustain, it can be autonomous, and it'll work. That I developed our district level, our, our building level finance class that has to run as an online course at Oklahoma State. I don't have a choice in the matter because we have to open it up for alternative certifications throughout the state of Oklahoma. This past spring, I spent roughly three to four hundred hours developing and designing that course. Um, it's done. I'm going to run it every year. I'm telling you, the amount of effort that I will spend on that class will be to grade three papers and to grade two discussion boards, so five things. And I have all of my announcements ready to auto-generate. I have all my quizzes, midterms, and finals ready to go. Um, and I have video lessons that were actually recorded and screen, screen captured um, that I've used, both ones that I've done face-to-face -face lecture and one they can do for a quick and dirty. Um, as long as I'm here, that's going to be the easiest class I've ever, had to I've ever had to teach. It will be very little effort for me. But in the beginning, the development was insane, but I did it the right way. If you ever get to be faculty and you get to design and develop online courses, <clears throat> my advice for you is do it right the first time, and then you have something that's going to work and be effective. So then we have the MOOC, which is one of the research areas I'm working on. MOOCs can enroll thousands of students but many people think that they're not sustainable. We'll see. So what is a MOOC? Um, I've been presenting on this at UCA and NEFC, um, basically saying that I want a different approach for this. I think MOOCs are being used wrong. Um, I think they're being used as substitutions for education. I want to use them for professional development. My belief, and this is similar to you know Terry in our class, um, who, who thinks that we should be having more work for superintendents, I think principals need more work on school finance. So I'm trying to design an administrative professional development around school finance and use as a MOOC and, and try to familiarize principals with the opportunity to understand school finance better. So, you know, what we've said a million times, the role of school administration has changed over the last hundred years, but 
Since the 1980s, we've gone from instructional leader, transformational leader, now to performance analyst to market competitor. So next we're going to have a generational security guard, which is kind of where is the money going, and that could certainly impact our decision on what MOOCs should do. So wicked problems are problems that are too important to ignore and too complicated to fix because they can't stay fixed. I believe that MOOCs are a wicked problem because we're never going, you know, we're going to have to constantly revise and update them. Services in schools continue to increase, but the fiscal, the fiscal capabilities of everybody in the United States is threatened because of it. We're not expecting the number of young people to grow, especially those that have money. And this is why I, you know, I mentioned the American dream, the 2.4 children, married parents, and in, in, in a beautiful house. The number of young people in poverty continues to increase, but it's, the rich are having less and less children, and that can be a problem. So MOOCs, to give you a little bit of a background on them, um, enrollment is global. Hundreds of thousands of people can take them at the same time. Most individuals that do MOOCs have already earned degrees, which is why I value this and think that this could be incredibly beneficial for school leadership. Um, so it offers this door to professional development that wasn't originally there, and that can be a big deal. So users engage with MOOCs as a tool for professional development and enrichment. Most individuals just lurk. They do what they need to do without finishing the course. Um, but then different formats are trying, are trying to change professional development needs and offer different sort of things with MOOCs. So if you see a MOOC, I think it's important that you know the difference of what a MOOC is. Um, 1.0 is, comes from the elite universities offering them to students but of, uh, also offering open source. Um, the 2.0 is more social networking and giving you resources, and the 3.0 gives you certificates, badges, and accreditation. So 1.0 um, really are used to keep the brand reach going through continuing education, get global recruitment, um, offer outreach to alumni so that you can have money to fund it, and strengthen a political base if you're trying to advance an agenda on a campus. Um, the university provider does not grant credits mostly unless you pay for them. Um, but, there's, but there's also, you know, it's also very expensive to produce MOOCs as well that can cause a problem as well. <clears throat> so the open global networks are ways that you can share and improve teaching glo uh, globally more than anything else. Um, you have different peer interactions using social networking like Facebook, using Wikispaces, using OERs, um, and this helps because it's open to everybody and you can make changes on it, and it really is creating this global environment and this global perspective on what we believe schools should look like. <clears throat> 3.0 is the post-degree world. This is something that I think can be used in education and very beneficial. If we have online certificates and we offer people badges and different things that are going to change how they, you know, how we look at a particular topic. Um, you can update people with professional development that have been out of schools for five to ten years, but the question is, would the state respect this? Would the federal government respect this as potential, um, is, is potential something to help improve education? And I think that's up to you to determine that. My belief is, for professional development, I think it could. So in terms of school reform, um, I think the key is you have to connect, you really have to connect MOOCs to finance and policies. If we see that school finance is one of the biggest problems, uh, MOOCs really can offer updated skills on school finance that our school principals need. And it's one of the reasons why I like them um, and why I think they can be effective. So what can a MOOC offer in terms of work on school finance? Um, it can be interactive with traditional learning management software. Um, you don't need to reinvent the wheel if we already have software that's working, which we do. It can work. We have declining funding for professional development for school administrators. So a MOOC would be affordable, it would be low cost, and it would offer a professional development opportunity that might not normally exist. Um, they can be updated as the state changes, as management needs change. Um, right now, our big ideas that we're looking at, and all of you know this, are school mergers, um, nationalization of curriculum, so how does that affect school finance? 
We could look at it, we could argue one way or the other, and we could use that to determine what's appropriate for our MOOC. 